one hour distance three fibers out uh, and not in the same location so it oh. not it was not just one digging a hole uh, yeah yeah so so maybe there are some there are many servers went offline or something no not 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 uh, I was not uh, one of the victims um, uh. <laughs> but I think a lot of companies had had trouble. But okay, mm -hmm. hope hope the internet will uh, will survive. Yes, yes, uh, we'll we'll have at least forty five minutes of uh, yeah every time this morning. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, 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 that just remind me of the offline editing. Mm -hmm. Something related to the CRDG. Yeah, just um, uh. Couple of weeks ago, a friend me a friend told me the idea of offline editing the session, uh, which is um, uh, Adobe uh, is trying to put LibreOffice on the web with WebAssembly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, their idea is that um, they are trying to make your browser an editor to a session, and that session can be serialized and can be transmitted after your editing. So uh, that is uh, not a clone, but uh, the decentralized idea of the Google Doc. Google yeah. Doc is, uh, is deployed on the server, but yeah. uh, if you can do in offline editing, you can just finish your editing offline and transmit your session to others mm -hmm. by just transmit your session, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, Google Docs is based on operational transforms, which means that uh, um, there is a central server that's serializing all of the edits. And so when you send it an edit, um, it has to, uh, it considers that a transformation of the uh, of the document. It has to, uh, um, or I'm sorry, it considers that an op operation <laughs> on the document, and uh, it has to transform it into a different operation in order to uh, um, to serialize it after something that you hadn't seen before um, so that it produces the output that you expect. Um, so yeah, there has to be a central coordinator for that to happen. And so yeah, Google Docs, uh, um, not, so, uh, uh, you know, not so useful uh, in offline mode. It's intended for um, collaborative editing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, Martin Kleppman has been doing a, a lot of really awesome work on, um, on a, CRDD, a CRDT uh, based um, uh, text editor uh, idea. So um, yeah, one of the original CRDTs was TreeDoc, uh, and that was uh, a, uh, um, a tree structure that represented ed edits to a, uh, a document. Um, and basically the improvements that uh, Martin Kleppman and his uh, collaborators have been doing have uh, really optimized that so that uh, the um, you know, they, they're able to, to compress those operations uh, and uh, and get it down to where the file size of the history is about on the same order as the uh, the file size of just the, uh, the the regular document if it didn't have any history. So that's uh, that's pretty cool, cool. stuff. So um, so yeah, is this based on uh, Martin Kleppman's work or is this uh, um, is this new stuff? Yeah, good, good to hear. But I I found that people on Hackers News, uh, you know the website Hacker News. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, people people they are still wondering why this kind of technology is not widespread into um, the mainstream mm -hmm. criteria. Yeah. Just people are, are wondering um, why 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 we don't see this this type of application everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, so the work that um you know, that that I've been focusing on and that uh, that you know, Jan and I have been uh, working on here together uh, has been really focused on um application data structures um not uh freeform documents. Um so I don't think that uh, um that the the type of CRDT that we're using here is really the best uh, choice for oh. for a, a text document, but uh, but 
you know, uh, a, a directed acyclic graph is only one kind of CRDT, and uh, what you're talking about is a different kind of CRDT. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, uh, purpose built for that uh, for that exact function. Um, yeah, this one is purpose built to be uh, a generic application database. So, purpose built okay. for applications, whatever that means. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, uh, so Jan, have you got uh, uh, some more stuff to share today? Uh, you're muted. Uh, you I think I have one small idea, small and simple idea. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah, Jan, we're not uh, hearing it yet. Try uh, screen. Did you see my screen? Yes. 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 Coming up. Yeah. So I came up with a small idea on uh, on writing a value to a variable in a multi-reader single writer, uh, possibly with multi-writer scenario. Uh, that is, we use a circular linked list to copy and update the value. So the, so I, the idea is that uh, we use uh, the writer initially write the value to like uh, the, the a1 state mm -hmm. state and the multiple readers can read the value from a1 and the next time writer want to update the value uh, it make the replica of a1 and put it to a2 then modify the value of a2 then uh, the reader follows the writer to the a2 to read the new value and the next next time writer, update the value to A0, then to A1, to A2 again. Um, the circular enables the eventual consistency on the value. So at least uh, in in this case, it's, uh, it's three. In, in every three rounds, the readers can get the latest value on the variable A. And mm. another approach is that uh, this does not require lock which we um, traditionally use lock to deal with kind of multi-reader single writer problem. So in uh, in in my idea, I, I don't use lock to synchronize uh, writers and readers. And also, there's no no need to call free to free up the memory allocation. So uh, because there there are a fixed size of the circular link list, so there's no need to free the mm -hmm. memory space. So there won't be the problems like dangling pointer or double free. And um, so and the, the fixed size circular length is the uh, similar concept to the memory pool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but there are still some defectors. Uh, so the, the biggest one is that it's not suitable for multiple writers for, uh, for now. Um, I have come up with some ideas to enable this for multiple writers, but uh, I'm I'm not sure how to uh, solve the conflict when uh, multiple writers right. try to update one on the same state. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, I, have, I have one idea. Is that uh, sorry? Yeah. This this looks very similar to a ring buffer. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, so that data structure is really good at at, at uh, zero lock um, uh, you know, operations. So uh, um, so yeah, it looks like here you've you've kind of expanded the uh, the ring buffer, which is usually consecutive memory, uh, into uh, into a linked list. Which um, yeah, if you're not if you're not expanding that uh, that linked list, um, it seems like a uh, a ring buffer would work just as well. But uh, um, but uh, being a linked list, you could actually expand it at any one of those uh, at any one of those points. Um, so it is a little oh. bit more of a dynamic structure by uh, by choosing the linked list or the circular linked mm -hmm. list. Interesting. Yeah, but uh, I think it's still um, localized in its behavior that uh, that this is uh, this is a data structure that um, that uh, uh, works works well in uh, in a specific location, but if you've got uh, a replica of this data structure somewhere else, um, mm. I don't see how the two 
uh, converge. So maybe you're yeah maybe getting to that. Yeah, I, I just um, like practicing using the idea of uh, replications. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe it could it be yeah. useful in some future cases. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the um, yeah the the rules that uh, that would help you to make sure that it converges uh, uh, in replicas. Um, yeah, those would be the uh, the rules that the uh, the, the operations are um, uh, commutative, uh, uh, associative, and idempotent, um, and uh, and so yeah, I, uh, you know, my favorite way to uh, to think about that is to think about a uh, uh, defining a greater than operator uh, uh -huh. or greater than and equal to operator. Um, so if you're talking about sets, then you know, is a subset of, um, or is a superset of really is you know, is a superset of means greater than or equal to, um, and mm -hmm. and so if you can define that relation, then you make sure that every update um, produces a state that is greater than or equal to the original state, and then merge uh, of uh, of two states oh. computes the least upper bound. So the the state that is greater than or equal to both of the uh, the two that were merged so in the case of sets um that's uh, mm -hmm. that's set union in order to do the the merge because now you've got a superset of of each of the uh, the two originals and uh um you know a set uh, insert um would be uh, an update um so so yeah in this case so far i don't see anything that's constraining the uh, the update at a1 for example to be mm -hmm. a uh, um, you know a, a, you know something that produces a, a greater than or equal to kind of a state, um, yeah. So I think I think without that you'd be able to find a a, a situation in which um, you you get divergent behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I I, I I think I can like like how do you say I can make more um, extension on on the idea and mm -hmm. maybe put some more ideas from from like from 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 what I have read in your book or maybe other references. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah, that uh, that site that you shared uh, last time, the uh, the CRDT. Uh documentation that's that's got uh, a lot of great ideas that um, that I think could could be merged into this because I think you know what the, the problem that you're solving here um, is uh, is the the local efficiency having the uh, uh, the, yeah, the yeah. zero lock uh, data structures um, mm -hmm. so um, so yeah I think uh, uh, yeah I think CRDTs um, you know they 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 prove strong eventual consistency um, Mm -hmm. But you know, just in and of themselves, they they don't prove that uh, uh, that the implementation is going to be efficient. Um, uh, yeah, but one one nice thing is that if you've got a CRDT based solution, then you know that your locks aren't waiting on a remote system, because all you have to mm -hmm. do is uh, is merge locally. But that merge operation could be an expensive operation, and if you uh, if you start to think about uh, using data structures like this in order to perform those updates and those merges, um, then you can have even those be uh, really fast local operations. So, so yeah, I like where this is headed. Yeah. Thanks for your opinion. Cool. That's, that helped a lot. Awesome. Yeah, so here's, here's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. Michael, mm -hmm. <laughs> hey. if you, I have a pool. Is uh, Caden? Are you? Do you still have questions or? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, I have more questions than answers, <laughs> like usual. <laughs> okay. Um, I go back into the data types. Um, for the. The fact graphs, the facts, the fact reference, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, 
then looking to the save the load and the query. Um, but I, I got confused again. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, wait, how can do. I, yeah, how can I show, because I have them in two Excel spreadsheets here. Um, perhaps I should just make it just half of the screen. Uh, let's see that and try to, to share that. Um, yeah, no, he's gonna, he's gonna get, no, no, it's, it's just the full screen that you get. Um, wait, if I go back to this, like this, it's, it's probably not readable. No, it's not. But if you, uh, um, if you control no, I would. scroll, yeah. yeah. That. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's looking better. Here. Yep. Make this one bigger. This one a little bit smaller. Okay, so left. Uh, no, we already shifted here. So on the left, we have the data structures in JavaScript. On the right, if it is not mirrored, we have .NET. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, we have just the fact. The fact uh, has a reference, which is the fact reference type, which is a type and a hash, both strings. Mm -hmm. The fact also had the predecessors, which is just an immut immutable list of predecessors, with each time a role, and then a, one or multiple fact references. Yeah. Yes. And then. And then we have fields, which is just an immutable list of fields. Mm -hmm. So that it's pretty much the same with um, a fact in in uh, what we see here. Yeah, That's there's fact. there's one little subtlety in the JavaScript implementation that yeah. it's going to be kind of hard to represent in C sharp. Yeah, the indexing. Right. Yeah, a role can uh, can be an array of fact references or a single fact reference. Um, and as far as the database is concerned, it treats them both the same. So that's probably not going to come up for the operations that you're talking about here. Um, where that uh, comes into play is the, um, the deserializing that back into a, uh, a JavaScript object for the application. Um, so it has to know whether to give you an array containing one, uh, uh, one element or uh, an object, just that element. Okay. Um, but you do have the the same the same here, no? The predecessor could be just a single fact reference, or an immutable list of fact references. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. That's yeah. You're right. That is how that's. Wait, how, how was that implemented? Uh, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, so we, uh, a role. Um, yeah, so this is a... Um, Why did I just go... um, Definition of facts. If we go to facts... Um, yeah, because you had... Wasn't that... Um, mm -hmm. Multiple predecessors? And single predecessor. Right. Yeah. So now I'm wondering yep. why um, why this isn't an immutable dictionary, where you can look it up by role, and then the value is either a fact reference or an immutable list of fact references. Um, but yeah, you know, that would that would constrain the uh, uh, the data type so that you couldn't have the same role appear in that collection twice, and that's that's uh, the constraint that we want to uh, to implement there. But um, yeah, it looks like I, uh, uh, I chose a, uh, a weaker, uh, data type, a weaker set of constraints. So in fact, this block in .NET corresponds to this block in JavaScript. Right. Yes. But then in JavaScript, we have the sig the signatures, mm -hmm. which we don't have in, in .NET, apparently. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. 
where that ended up. Um, um, yeah, something, something's telling me that um, I ended up uh, wanting signatures to work in the opposite direction. Um, we do have the database, uh, which has the signature table. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is that um, uh, I should be able to evaluate a, uh, um, a fact and then um, authorize it to so know that, um, that it came from an actor that is, um, that is authorized to, uh, to have created that fact. Uh, and, so, um, and so I can do that by uh, looking at, uh, um, at the, the signatures, um, first of all, validating them to make sure that, uh, that they are cryptographically correct signatures, uh, given their, their public keys, and then also run the authorization uh, check locally, just uh, just on this machine with the facts that are already available to this machine. And if any one of those signatures is um, is valid according to those authorization authorization rules, then um, then accept the uh, the fact. Um, but yeah, doesn't that mean that 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 signature has to be saved in the database uh, right away? Because Im yes. imagine I I create a fact. So that fact is saved in the database. So that the signature should be calc be calculated and, and saved immediately with it. Yes. Yeah, we want to do that uh, on the edge as we're receiving the facts. Um, so so yeah, by the time it gets to the uh, the database tier, um, then um, then you can assume that the authorization has already taken place. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, not only is that uh, uh, a um, a performance uh, concern, but that's also um, uh, the, the whole idea of revocation and uh, uh, a fact that is authorized at one point after you revoke that authorization. If you were to look at it again, it would no longer be authorized. Its, uh, it's signature would be from somebody that no longer has authorization. And since there's no uh, causal connection between that revocation and this fact that occurred in the past. You can't actually tell that it occurred in the past. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you have to authorize it upon receipt. If you were then to share with somebody and you share the revocation first and then you shared this fact, they would reject the fact and you would end up in a, in a place where, um, where things were not consistent, which is yeah. a, a reality and, uh, and a, a, mm -hmm. uh, a problem for which I don't have a, uh, a solution besides blockchain. <laughs> no, but that, that was, in, in fact, the, the revocation of, of permissions. Right. right. But, but here, but here we are, we create a fact, we save that fact as the author of a fact. Shouldn't I, I sign that fact immediately? Yes. And, and then at the moment that it arrives at, at some other server, there the signature will, will be um, checked whether the signature is valid um, with the public, with my public key. Yes. But at the moment that I create the fact, I should save a signature. Correct, yes. And then why, so in, in JavaScript, we define this fact envelope, which is in fact the fact plus the signature. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in .NET. Yeah, I, I can't remember exactly why I made that change when going to .NET. Um, the, the, the structure that you see in .NET is actually what the JavaScript structure used to look like. Um, I added the, uh, um, the envelope uh, later and then uh, propagated okay. that change through several different layers, um, and uh, so perhaps yeah. perhaps that signature has not been added to the .NET because indeed the repository uh, I think it dates the last change from December, so and that was the moment that you you changed the the data tables. Yes. So yes. that might so, be the explanation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, 
Yeah, it could just be that uh, that yeah, I added fact envelope to JavaScript after I made the uh, the .NET data structure. Um, that might be the reason. Okay, hmm. but I, I will. I can check it in uh, in GitHub when it has been added. And then we have um, a packed graph, yeah, which is in fact a top topological order of of all the packed references. Yes. Yes. Um, but that fact graph, um, because I was running through one of few of the tests that you defined in .NET. My understanding was initially that it contained the whole graph of all the facts in the database, but that doesn't mm, seem no. to be the case. No, it's uh, it's a a subset of a graph necessary for whatever operation you're doing right now. Um, so it is a complete subset in that uh, if a, uh, or it, it, it follows the transitive closure. Um, if a fact is in the fact graph, then its predecessor is also in the fact graph. And then apply that uh, recursively and you get, uh, um, you get a meaningful fact graph. Um, and so when, um, when you're, you're loading a, uh, a fact from the server, in fact, it is uh, producing a fact graph. Uh, that contains that fact. And so that's why you load a, a collection of hashes. And then it says, okay, put all these in the uh, in the fact graph and all their predecessors, um, removing duplicates. Okay, now you've got a, a subset of, of my graph that, uh, that you're interested in. Okay, so in, in fact, um, the application, we only take, we load when we load, it will only be the facts that we need with all the predecessors for each fact. Yes. That is correct. Okay. So we can continue to add facts without uh, having to add more memory. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I was I was missing some facts on the moment that I saved facts, I say. Well, <laughs> why are they not in? Um, but okay. And then in this uh, get predecessor and get predecessor multiple, um, I know I had this question long ago, and then you answered it, and again I I I missed it. Mm -hmm. um, wait, where was that? Um, that was in the facts here. And let me let me switch screen. Um, so video stop. Oh, the camera is sharing. And then I go to the other one. Um, no, that's video or screen sharing, yeah. Um, why is that one? Um, no, not the data structures. Strange, where's my Visual Studio? That's funny. Um, question data structures when ah, Ginaga.net, it must be. Yeah, it's this one. Um, let me make it a bit smaller. like this that should be readable yes yeah there we go um so we have this uh get predecessor single and we have this get predecessor multiple yes so single if the reference dot count is bigger than zero and it says okay it's not a single one mm -hmm. But in the multiple, we have the same. Um, and it just returns a single. So I'm. Right. So. Um, I'm, I'm mixing up something. Yeah. Um, so if you. if you, um, So kind of going back to my confusion about why I chose a list versus a dictionary. 
um, there should only be one uh, element in that list with this particular role. Um, so, so this is this is uh, you know, this logic would be a lot simpler if I had just said it's a dictionary where the role gives you either a uh, a fact instance or a uh, um, uh, I'm sorry a fact reference or a uh, um, an array of uh, fact references. Um, but that that thing that contains the fact reference or the array of fact reference is just one object. So there should okay. only be one of those um, in the collection for a particular role. Right, so yes, these are the predecessors. So references dot count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's a predecessor of the type. Either it's the predecessor of type multiple. Mm -hmm. Either it's a predecessor of type single. Right, right. And so you, you can you can have exact one uh, predecessor of type single with this role, mm -hmm. or you can have one predecessor of type multiple with the same role. Is right. it? Is it that? Yes, that is that is correct. Um, and actually. Uh, reviewing this code, there's uh, there's another um, there's another uh, condition that it's not properly catching, and that is if for, uh, somehow you put a predecessor single and a predecessor multiple with the same role, um, it will happily uh, uh, allow you to do that, and it'll just pick one or the other based on which one you call, but uh, that wouldn't be correct. Um, so yeah, I, th I think I really would like to turn this into a dictionary. That would uh, that would remove this confusion mm -hmm. because so yeah, for example yeah, we should we should look at it on, on a real in a real model eh? um, mm. right, we had some some nice models in here where are they? They were as a model. Um, yeah, by the time it gets up to your application code and you see it in a model like this, it's uh, um, all of that implementation details abstracted away. Yeah. yeah but to, to, to reason about it, um, example you, you had a client with a certain name mm -hmm. so that that name can be changed so a name can have multiple uh, predecessors if we made a s simultaneous uh, name change hmm? mm -hmm. yes um, but so the the role will will be in that case um, the, the name change uh, the uh, the role would be prior um, because that's the name of the uh, of the predecessor in uh, in client so we've got the uh, the client name array prior as one of the uh, parameters to the record so that sets up the uh, um, the predecessor multiple uh, objects with the uh, uh, the role name of prior yeah, so that means in this case, you either have a single previous name, or you have multiple previous names. Yeah, or you could even have an empty array uh, for the for your very first name. Yeah. And so all of those would be represented as a predecessor multiple, um, and then the array inside a predecessor multiple would either be empty, contain one element, or contain multiple elements. So yeah, it wouldn't switch between predecessor multiple and predecessor single based on the number of elements that are in that prior array. And when do you use predecessor single then? Uh, when the data type 
uh, is declared as there being only one predecessor. So for example, client. Um, so that one is just client, not client array. And so it's going to um, record that as predecessor single and put that, uh, that client reference in that uh, object. Line being the predecessor of? Uh, of um, client name. Yeah, so we're, we're still looking at the line 14. So it's still uh, the client name. The client name has um, two predecessor roles, client and prior. So yeah. no matter um, no matter which client name you're, you're talking about, um, that, uh, that list of that, that list that's called predecessors inside of the, uh, the data structure will always have two elements. Um, there's going to be one with the role of clients and it's going to be a predecessor single. And then there's going to be another one with the role of prior and it's going to be a predecessor multiple. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And so just for, for this client, we use the uh, predecessor single and for prior, we use predecessor multiple, yep. even if there is no client name defined yet. Correct. Okay. That helps. Um, and then when, when an application starts up, so the fact graph, uh, it's not all the, f the facts together, just the facts that, that we need. Um, right. Then how, then how will, yeah, for example, if, if we would say, okay, give me all, all my clients. Um, and it will just load all the facts from the clients. And every client will go in, in his own fact graph in that case. Um, yes, that's that's going to happen in uh, in two steps. So, um, and and so this is really thinking about it from the uh, the the API perspective. So thinking about um, um, just over the uh, over the wire, um, your uh, your application talking to the server is going to say, uh, I'm, I'm interested in all of the clients, uh, for this particular supplier. And, uh, so then the server is going to, uh, to run query and it's going to give back a list of fact references. So that's going to be okay. Here are the, uh, the hashes of all the, uh, uh, DWS clients. So, uh, yeah. you just get those hashes. Um, and then the application is going to look in its database and see which hashes it does not yet have, and then send just that list back and say, I want to load just these. And load is the first time that, um, that the fact graph comes into play. So, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the server will then take each of those, uh, those hashes, look them up and add them all to the same fact graph. And so that fact graph will con uh, contain all of those um, uh, DWS clients, and it will also contain the supplier. Uh, that is the same predecessor of all of them. So you'll get a, uh, uh, a graph with just one supplier, lots of, lots of clients. Mm -hmm. And so it sends that graph back and, uh, and then the application just performs a merge and it says, okay, I already know about that supplier, but thank you for including it because now I know how it uh, fits in with the rest of the graph. And uh, then it, uh, um, it saves everything into its database that it doesn't yet have and hooks up all the foreign keys. Yeah. But then when it, when it loads all the clients, it will automatically also take all the client names with it? Uh, not automatically. That's, that's if that is part of the, uh, the query. So, um, so thinking about it just as a, a linear query as it is right now, um, then the query would be, uh, from this supplier, uh, follow the successor, um, uh, using the, uh, the supplier role to database clients and then follow the successor from there 
in role of client uh, to the DWS client name. Um, and so that uh, that pipeline goes to the um, goes to the server, and then it runs that query, and it says, "Okay, I've I've got all of the client names, and I'm just going to send them back to you." Um, and so that uh, um, that's not a query of all, of all the clients. That's a query of all the client names. Um, and then you perform the um, you you say, oh, I, "I don't have these facts with these hashes." So uh, so here, do a load with this set of hashes, and then the server builds that uh, that fact graph. And so this time it's single supplier, multiple clients, and then client names underneath those in order to build that uh, transitive closure. And it sends back that graph. So you get the uh, the set of clients out of that uh, um, that linear query. Okay. Um... With a caveat. You don't, uh, with that linear query, get back clients that don't yet have names. We get clients that don't. Yeah, because that's an inner join essentially that you're doing there, hmm. um, and that's why um, uh, I need to uh, to support projections as uh, mm -hmm. as part of query. So you can say I want all the clients, and then for each one I want all their names, and then that would perform an outer join. Okay, that yeah, that you see the whole the whole as an as an the projection as an entity that you can yeah. A query. Yep, because right now, as you were saying, and uh, you know, kind of leading up to, uh, you have to do that in two passes. Give me all the clients, and then give me all the client names. Yeah. Yeah, as as long as you limit it to a few facts and you can draw them, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy to visualize it. <laughs> uh, but the moment, the moment that you get into more facts. Um, And then if, if you're fast enough, forget what you learned before, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is my case. <laughs> oh, I, I even had trouble. Remember the shared list? Uh, before I was programming a little bit in it, I just added uh, one or two features when you, when you made it. Uh -huh. and, and now I already had to, to look up the Java syntax again. Yeah. Uh, that with, that, with that index, I said, what does it mean? Uh, a colon and another colon. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, my memory lets me. And, and still this week I met somebody who said, but you have an excellent memory. I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure we've not, met. Not. <laughs> you might be talking no. about a different Jan. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um was there a single graph and the predecessors a signature and what um so in javascript we had that fact path which is actually just an array of fact references yeah um yeah. that um that might be going away once uh once i add um projection support so the idea was in a um, in a linear um, uh, query. So you've taken all those steps. Uh, at each one of those steps, um, it records the, uh, uh, the, the fact reference. So when it gives you back a, uh, a set of results, um, it's, uh, it's going to include uh, all of the steps along the way. And the reason for that is um, is so that uh, if you if you went down the graph and then back up, so you like uh, okay, I'm I'm looking for yeah you know, all of my um, assignments and uh, and then I want to go back up to the um, uh, the you know the customer to which you know, I was assigned. So now uh, if you just uh, gave the results of that graph uh, of that query, it would be a collection of of customers. Um, you wouldn't know about the assignments, <laughs> and that's that's the important part. Um, so, so yeah, it included all steps along that path. Um, now that uh, that I've refined my thinking around uh, what it really means to do a query, um, what uh, what that's really 
uh, about is uh, this query is a uh, um, a, a set of uh, of paths between different labeled um, facts, and a uh, a path can uh, can only um, go um, go up and then back down. So that means the labels have to start at the the valleys of uh, of the graph. And so rather than giving you the entire path, if I just give you the the labeled references, then when you compute the transitive closure, you'll get everything. So um, so yeah, when when I add projection support to the API, then um, it's going to return those labeled uh, references. And so the idea of the fact path is uh, is not going to be um, as important. It might actually just fall away. Um, and the fact that you worked in JavaScript with single single fact envelope, and there's a single fact, mm -hmm. and in .NET with a fact graph, um, is it just a matter of, of avoiding latency because you you go and write very often in JavaScript? Um, no, it was um, it was a matter of looking forward to um, to uh, basically a, uh, a, a a service that's running um, uh, offline, kind of uh, you know, not not directly uh, connected to the um, you know the, the the individual user. So um, so yeah, if uh, if you uh, you start up the uh, so just thinking about uh, Janaka JS running on the web. So you start up a web application. Uh, you're in your browser. It uh, redirects you to a login page, uh, and then now you've got a, a token. So that uh, that OAuth token, good for a short period of time, and uh, has no idea what you're going to do with it. So it's not causally connected to the uh, the facts that you're about to uh, um, to send. Um, and and now as a as a client you don't have your private key. Um, the uh, the key store hasn't shared that with you. It's not part of that uh, that OAuth token. Um, so instead, uh, every time you create a fact, uh, as far as the the client is concerned, uh, that fact is not signed. Um, there's no way to uh, to sign it. But uh, but then as soon as the server receives it. The server says, "Oh, here's an OAuth token, so I can look you up in the key store, and I have access to your private key. Uh, here are the facts that uh, that you are uh, sending me as new. I run my authorization um, uh, check here and say, "Yep, you are authorized to have created these facts. And so now I will sign these facts uh, on your behalf. Um, and so you know, they go in, and uh, and then they're shared out with." Uh, with uh, other interested parties. Now, if one of those interested parties is running a uh, a service, so maybe it's doing a uh, uh, an API integration. So you you said, okay, I'm uh, I'm interested in submitting to this uh, uh, to this conference, and there's something over here that says, oh, I know how to talk to Sessionize. Um, so so now I receive that fact. Uh, I, I can uh, uh, I can send a request to Sessionize on your behalf, um, but it doesn't have your OAuth token. Um, it's it's running completely outside of your session, um, and it might actually even pick up that uh, that fact after your OAuth token has expired. So, um, so instead, uh, it's going to rely upon the fact that uh, that fact was signed using your uh, your private key, which you can verify because it knows your public key. Runs its authorization rules, said yeah, it really is you, um, and uh, and makes that API call. So that was the um, yeah that that's the use case that uh, that I was building up there, um, and uh, so it it might just have been that uh, uh, in order to get to this this minimal st uh, viable state in uh, in dot net I didn't need that complexity yet, um, or it might have been that uh, um, that I added that after. Um, after doing this, but but yes, I think I added fact envelopes far enough back.
but yeah, they are they are part of the uh, um, the data structure, so they're 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 stored in the database. Okay. I will uh, I will have a look at at that. Um, the pieces start falling a little bit uh -huh. back into position. But these data structures, they are not so complicated, but I find it difficult to to visualize it. Yeah. Yeah, and and there is a bit of um, of incremental, um, you know, building up of the data structures over time, and uh, you know, you know, test driving, you know, uh, my way to uh, to a, an appropriate data structure in order to meet a particular uh, use case. So, yeah, in the effort of uh, of not, uh, you know, over engineering, doing big des big design up front, um, you know, sometimes that means that. Uh, you know, that you miss something that ends up being important later, uh, and that might be what happened here. Okay. I think uh, that will uh, help me to get uh, to get further in it. Very good. Yep. Yeah. I. Uh, um, yeah. I might. I might. Uh, um, uh, take a take a look through the uh, the dot net code again and and try to refresh my memory of uh, uh why is it that um that fact envelope doesn't appear yet in uh, in dot net um cuz that's that's going to be important uh, in order to talk to the api and i know that, that was one of the uh, one of the first things that we wanted to uh, to accomplish here Hmm. Okay, but then again, um, yeah. Since that might that actually might be the answer. Um, since uh, so far, Janaka.net is intended for client side use. Um, then uh, the the API that we're talking about here is the one that uh, that uses an OAuth token in order to uh, to authenticate you. So you don't. Um, you know, in Janaga JS on the web, you don't have your your private key. In uh, Janaga.net, um, in a mobile application, um, I would expect it to be the same idea that uh, the mobile application does not have your private key, but it's instead relying upon the uh, the key store. Um, that uh, that makes it possible for you to log into uh, a different mobile application or or log into um, you know, a, a web application and still, uh, and still work with, and you know, still be you, you know, still have your same identity. Um, so that actually might be the reason is that uh, you're looking at code that was intended for the server side and code that was intended for the, the client side and uh, uh, envelopes um, did not appear on the client side. On, on on the client, um, e even there you, it's it's where the at the origin of a fact. You have to sign the fact to. To to declare your identity, no. Um, not uh, not at the absolute origin. So the uh, the the actual user with the with the mobile device. Um, so if. Um, if they did need to sign the fact at that particular point in time, they would need to have the private key. Um, yeah. And um, and yeah, this this protocol is not designed to um, to share the private key with the the mobile app and have it uh, do that signature, um, because uh, the the equivalent idea in the web browser would be very unsafe. <laughs> you don't want to share. A, a private key with some JavaScript running inside of your browser. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think I think the same. Yeah, certainly the same. If, if we're reusing the same API, um, it has to continue to be that way. But uh, but even even thinking about it just from a security uh, position, I think that's still the the right position to take. Uh, if this is not a zero trust. 
uh, you know, concept. This is this is limited trust. So I'm going to trust the um, the server to which I connect, um, and it's going to trust this uh, this OAuth token that I received from some other server over here. So there's there's a bit of uh, of trust there. But then once the facts get into the uh, uh, the database and into the substrate, at that point you no longer need to trust. So you don't have uh, um, you don't have OAuth tokens. Uh, instead, you just have the signatures. So so yeah, it, um, it's not signed at the point of origin, but it's signed very uh, very soon afterward. Um, so well, did, 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 did it arrive on, on the server? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I need to call my place it's about to close. So yeah, I I need to leave for now. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Caden. Okay. Yeah, we're about to wrap okay. up this one. So. Bye bye. Go. Okay. See yeah. you, Caden. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so yeah. Given that, actually, um, you don't need to have a signature table on the um on the uh, the mobile database at all okay um and it will be the server that's the first server to which you connect that signs on your behalf right yes that's the server that that keeps the the private keys for um for its its clients uh, right so exactly yep okay and if you have multiple servers the other servers they will not know the private keys. They will right. just have the public keys to, to verify. Right, yes. And that's it. <laughs> that was Discord again. Uh -huh. oh, so I said, uh, the other uh, servers, they just have the public keys. They don't have the private keys of, of my clients. That's correct, yes. Okay. Good. That uh, gives me additional things to think. Yeah. And hopefully to, <laughs> to get me on the way now. Um, yeah. And, and that takes some things off your plate. Uh, since you are working on the client-side database, you don't need to worry about envelopes or signatures. Yeah, no. I was comparing the two, trying to to walk through the JavaScript, and then I I see the signatures, and then I say, hey, but I'm missing them in in the mm -hmm. other, at the other end, and we do do have them in the, in the database. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, and that's a, that's the server side database that you're comparing with, yeah. Yeah, but um, when I get back facts from others in my telephone, I do need the, the signatures from the others just to verify that the facts are correct. Because I, I don't have my own private keys, but I do have the public keys of everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, the way that, uh, that I'm doing that on the web is, uh, is uh, just like we're, we're trusting the, the server with our private keys so that it can uh, sign things on our behalf. Um, we're also trusting that the server has run the authorization rules and is only giving us facts that are authorized. Um, so, so you know, if we if we stick with that uh, security position, then we don't even need the uh, the signatures to verify on our side. But that's provided that you always connect to our home server. Yeah, yeah. And the moment that that we would have multiple servers. Um... Yeah, yeah. That is that is true. Um, yeah. So this is uh, yeah. This is actually letting letting topology uh, into the uh, um, into the design. Um, and so yeah, if this were purely peer to peer, uh, and uh, your mobile application could could connect to uh, uh, to any other uh, server in the world, then um, then yeah, you would want to you know, completely encapsulate your identity on this uh, on this phone, and mm -hmm. uh, and trust no one, and do all the signatures and all the verification yourself. Um, and there, uh, there might be a, a valid use case for that. In which case, uh, I think we would want to um, we would want to modify the uh, the protocol to support that. Um, and in fact, that would end up with a protocol which would would be what servers would use to talk to each other. 
Um, so it wouldn't be a protocol that uh, that it, it, that assumes a uh, an OAuth key invalid or an OAuth token and validates that token. Um, instead, it would just be you know, here's some facts and signatures. You uh, you you know, cryptographically uh, uh, validate everything upon receipt. Um, so for um, for for this round, um, uh, I want to I want to continue with the um, the topological assumption that you're connecting to the same server, or at the very least, the same bank of servers, the same set of servers that have access to a, uh, a centralized um, key store. And okay. uh, yeah, so that's um, you yeah, know that's centralized for this one particular uh, you're, you're connecting through a particular url that you ship with the uh, the application and so it makes that connection uh, then all of these uh these load balance servers can connect to the key store and and uh, uh and use your your private key well, an extension would al always be possible mm -hmm. it, but it would be logical that the first time you connect you connect to your home server and then you could load your private key from your home server and from that moment onwards to the security mm -hmm. on the mobile phone and once you do that the next time you connect could be to to any any server yeah 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 and i i uh, um i think that uh, i think that that is a use case that we want to um to to evolve to support um yeah i don't think we can get there right out of the gate um mm -hmm. Because uh, because you know, right now the uh, uh, the Janaga JS server doesn't have a, a protocol that's intended for servers to talk to each other, um, so that's that's a direction in which um, which the server side needs to evolve as well. Yeah. Um, so it'll end up being the same protocol. Mm. But wait, Michael, mm -hmm. let let Jan catch up first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So let's <laughs> let's take this security position of mm. uh, of of limited trust, but not uh, not zero trust, yeah. and then we'll we'll get to the zero trust position later. Yeah. Let's let's get this working first. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to let you go to to work now. We are already four minutes over time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this. Now I'm glad that we were able to reason through that and uh, and uh, realize. Oh wait, no, it wasn't that. Uh, um, I forgot to uh, to do. Uh, uh, envelopes. It's just that not needed for this use case. So, so yeah, we will. Okay. Uh... Michael, thank you very much. See you next week. Yes, indeed. See you then. Next week I will be there. I think the week after or two weeks after. I'm going to miss one, one Thursday, but uh, next week I will definitely be there. Okay. That okay. sounds good. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. See you. Bye.